Hello, my name is Gary Rabin. I'm the Chairman, Chief Executive Officer, and Chief Financial Officer on an interim basis for Advanced Cell. What I want to do through this series of videos is introduce you to the fabric of this company. For so much of the history of Advanced Cell, there was a perception that the company really was a two-person company, that Bill Caldwell, the Chairman, CEO, and CFO, and Bob Lanza, the Chief Scientific Officer, were really the entirety of the company. But that couldn't be further from the truth. We have extensive experience in clinical and regulatory affairs, manufacturing, intellectual property and patent prosecution, administering all these things, and getting the company into the clinic. And I wanted to really introduce you to these people, these professionals that make up the backbone of our management team. I want to take this opportunity to introduce to you our Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Robert Lanza. You just heard from Gary Rabin, who is our CEO and Chairman of the Board of Directors. And in addition to Gary and myself, there is Stephen Price, who is the Senior Vice President of Corporate Development. There is Matt Vincent, who is Director of Corporate Development. Ed McEunis is Vice President of Regulatory. Roger Gay is Senior Director of Manufacturing. Rita Parker is our Director of Operations. And Kathy Singh is Director of Accounting. And you'll be hearing from each of them in the next few minutes. But before that, I would like to run through briefly some of our research in development programs at Advanced Cell Technology. These include retinal degeneration, corneal repair, single blastomer technology, cellular reprogramming, and hemangioblast-based programs under our JV with TriBioTech. And these include vascular repair, red blood cells, platelets, and multiple other cell types. First, I'd like to discuss the retinal degenerative diseases Advanced Health has received FDA approval to use retinal pigment epithelium, which are also known as RPE cells, and these are derived from embryonic stem cells, and these are used to treat age-related macular degeneration, as well as Stargardt's disease, which is one of the leading causes of juvenile blindness. AMD affects over 30 million people worldwide. It's the leading cause of blindness in patients over the age of 55 in the United States. The degeneration of the RPE plays a critical role in the development not only of AMD and Stargardt's disease, but also many other retinal degenerative diseases. The transplantation of RPE cells has been shown to rescue photoreceptors and attenuate the loss of visual function in animals. And we believe stem cells are a potentially important source of RPE for the transplantation into patients. This shows you the anatomy and function of RPE. As the light enters into the eye, it hits the photoreceptors. These are the cones and the rods we see with. And they are actually maintained by the RPE layer, shown here in purple. And these are critical for maintaining the health of the photoreceptors, including the phagocytosis of the shed photoreceptor segments. The advantage of using embryonic stem cells in regenerative uh, medicine are multiple, multiple. We virtually can create an unlimited supply of cells and tissues. These can be derived under GMP conditions, under pathogen-free conditions. We can produce them with minimal batch-to-batch -batch variation, and they can be thoroughly characterized to ensure optimal performance. We have generated RPE reliably from multiple embryonic stem cell lines. We have studied over two dozen embryonic stem cell lines, and they all reproducibly generate RPE that can be passage characterized and expanded. And ACT's proprietary RPE cell manufacturing process is protected by a number of patents. We also transplanted RPE into the subretinal space of various animals, and we have shown that they improve visual acuity and rescue photoreceptors in these animals. We've seen 100% improvement in visual function in the Royal College of Surgeon Rat, or the RCS Rat, over the uncontrolled, untreated animals. And importantly, in the histology, we've seen that in the untreated animal, there's only one layer of photoreceptors left. These animals are essentially blind after several months, whereas in the animals that received the transplanted RPE, we had a very robust layer of outer nucleated cells, so there was a five to seven layer thick uh, of photoreceptors. So hopefully we will see this type of photoreceptor rescue in patients. Our manufacturing process is not permissive for undifferentiated embryonic stem cells. We have an assay that's sensitive enough to detect even a single undifferentiated embryonic stem cell in over a million cells. 
We have carried out extensive studies to assess tumorigenicity. We have seen no safety signals, no tumors or ectopic tissue have been observed in any of our animals. Long-term data spanning the entire life of these animals revealed no evidence of teratoma formation after subretinal transplantation of our RPE cells. We also have a program in corneal repair where we have generated corneal endothelium from human embryonic stem cells. There are over 10 million people worldwide with corneal blindness. The cornea is the most transplanted organ, and a third of those are due to the, a defect in the endothelium and there's a failure of those cells. And solutions include the transplantation of the whole cornea, which is known as PKP, and that is the transplantation of the full thickness of the cornea. And more importantly, and more uh, recently, they have now just been transplanting the corneal epithelium attached to Desmase membrane, which is known as DSAC. And this just shows you the transplantation of the corneal endothelium on Desmase membrane. And we have generated these uh, corneal epithelium from human embryonic stem cells. They closely resemble normal corneal endothelium. And as you can see with markers for ZO1, which is the tight junction, as well as the sodium potassium ATPs pump, we can see the embryonic cells in both of these cases are almost identical to normal corneal endothelium. I would like to give you a brief overview of our hemangioblast research with ACT's joint venture. Hemangioblasts are bipotential cells that have the ability to turn into endothelium as well as vasculature. They also can turn into all the various immune lineages as well as the myeloid lineages. And this just shows you a colony of these hemangioblasts. And they are, 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 are quite smart and when they're injected into the circulation of animals within a day to two days, they actually start to go into sites of vascular injury and repair them. So here are hemangioblasts labeled in green, repairing damaged retinal vasculature, whereas in undamaged eyes, you can see the cells do not incorporate. We have also tested these cells in other animal models, including, including a rodent model of ischemic, ischemic limbs, and what you are seeing here is a Doppler of the hind legs of a mouse. And you can see the left leg here, there's no blood flow. Whereas within a month after the injection of the hemangioblast, we had complete restoration of the blood flow. We also studied these cells in a, a, a severe model of myocardial infarct in uh, the mouse model. And we saw a 50% reduction in the death rate of these animals. We have also turned these cells into various hematopoietic lineages, so we can now turn our hemangioblasts into entire tubes of red blood cells. And in addition to red blood cells, we've also had the ability now to turn these into megakaryocytes, which are large multinucleated cells that actually create platelets. And we have now shown that those platelets actually can form clots, and they also, in the animal, in vivo, are able to incorporate into a mouse thrombus at the site of laser-induced arterial injury. We have also created the first embryonic stem cell lines without embryonic destruction. The most basic objection to embryonic stem cell research is that it deprives embryo of their ability to, to generate a complete human being. And for over a decade, PGD has been used in IVF clinics in a single cell known as a blastomere is removed from the embryo for genetic testing. And this PGD procedure does not interfere with the developmental potential of the embryo. And literally thousands of healthy babies have been born using this procedure. And ACT has developed a method to generate embryonic stem cell lines using this, these single cells without embryonic destruction. So what you see here is that one blastomere is plucked out of an eight cell stage embryo. It's then turned into embryonic stem cell lines that are then able to turn into all three germ layers, including all the cell types of the body. And after that cell is removed from the embryo, the biopsied embryo is continued, continues to divide, and it eventually generates blastocysts, which are then frozen down and remain viable. And the embryonic stem cell lines from each of these embryos shows all the various markers of pluripotency. We also have a program in cellular reprogramming. And the goal here is to generate patient-specific cells for clinical translation. These involve the use of cell-penetrating peptides that eliminate the need for viruses and or foreign DNA, so no genetic manipulation is needed. We simply add the reprogramming proteins to our cell cultures, and ACT's reprogramming technology and our patent filings go back over a decade, long before Yamanaka 
first reported the generation of iPS cells. And this is potentially the future of stem cell technology with the ability to generate genetically matched cells from just a few skin cells. And this just is a brief overview of some of our programs here at ACT.